Hello, everybody. Hope you're all uh, sitting comfortably with or without a glass of wine, as you wish. Uh, somebody just make me a little sign on the chat, please, that you can hear me. It's all going well. And uh, we'll kick off this afternoon's session. So, great, thank you. You can, you've confirmed you can hear. Just come off a Zoom in Chinese to Shanghai. Well, my own Chinese is not quite what it might be, so uh, somebody had to translate. And I was doing it not on Zoom, but on WeChat, which meant I was just doing it on my mobile phone. So that was daunting. And uh, this evening, I hope will be more of a doddle in comparison. And it's white, which is good, because I'm getting really re-enthused with the white wines of Burgundy after a, a period in the wilderness. Um, and uh, we have discussed this on a, a, a separate session. We're not completely out of the woods as far as the premature oxidation of white burgundy is, but uh, nonetheless, things are looking better and I'm finding plenty more wines to enjoy. In fact, I've just been in Chablis for four days, uh, tasting the 2019s there, and uh, we'll find another moment to talk about Chablis and the Maconnais and anything else you want to talk about. Grand. So today's topic, however, is the white wines of the uh, Côte de Beaune. I could also mention uh, Côte de Nuit, but uh, they're rather more scattered. In fact, I'll just cover them quickly. Uh, so you've got uh, Maurice Saint Denis is a village where there's now quite a bit planted. Also, there's famous Aligoté in the Mont Louison, uh, but also Premier Cru Mont Louison from Dujac, some at the top of the slope as well, uh, from a number of people. Um, Bruno Claire has one, uh, Guillon has one, and Dujac have a village, Moray as well. Otherwise, Marcenet has got some uh, white wine, but I don't find it all that exciting. A couple of people are playing around with variations of Chardonnay up there. Um, and Louis Saint George has got some, most famously, the Pinot Noir, which then mutated into Pinot Blanc from uh, Domaine Henri Gouge and mutations thereof. And there's one vineyard in Louis Saint Georges, the Terre Blanche, at the top of the slope, which is a Premier Cru, which is not very interesting in red, but is uh, much better in white. Apart from that, I think the white wines, and I should have mentioned, of course, we would have tried it together, I think, more than once, but the Clos Blanc de Vougeot of Domaine de la Vougeray, um, and there is also the Musigny Blanc of de Vogue. But apart from that, in general, the whites of the Côte de Nuit are relatively anecdotal. Let's then instead move to the Côte de Beaune. And typically the whites are at uh, two ends with a batch of reds in the middle, i.e. they're up around the hill of Corton and then uh, for Merceau on downwards through to chassagne Maraché. But virtually every village in the uh, Côte de Beaune, apart from the two which aren't allowed to, which are Pomar and Volnay, but every other village has got a certain amount of white and a tendency in recent years to plant white even in bits that they shouldn't, because it's uh, easier to grow the whites, you get more yield, uh, you can bring them to marketplace a little bit earlier. Commercially, it's a sensible thing to do. I get sad if a clearly red wine terror gets terroir, which gets converted. We'll look at that most obviously, but not uniquely in chassin Maraschet. Grand, okay, uh, I'm gonna ask Scott, who is with us as ever, kindly uh, in the background, if you put up the map of uh, the Hill of Corton and we can play around with that. Those of you who were here last week will remember us doing this with uh, Hill of Corton and the red wines, but we'll look at slightly different uh, places uh, this time. Okay, I will uh, just take control of that. Um, so on the top, the forest full of rabbits and deer and wild boar and other things that want to eat vines. Down here, the Grand Cru Reds of Corson Charlemagne, also red along here. And then this bit, uh, there are really three parts to, uh, I suppose, to the um, Corson Charlemagne whites. And I actually have a view that, well, what I would like to see, I'm gonna, let, me, let me do it that way. Um, Choose my what I'm going to draw with. Uh, that's not very big. En Charlemagne and Le Charlemagne here. That's absolutely classic. Uh, you can see 
up here that tells us where north is, north south. So broadly speaking, uh, the vineyards here are west, with even a touch of north in them. Here they're west to southwest, or well, Le Chalamagne is more southwest, eventually moving around towards the south. And these are the two really classic bits that get Charlemagne in the name. Um, and uh, Bonny de Matre, for example, they sit astride uh, a little bit more in uh, this side of the dotted line in Alors Corton, uh, but they are also can be found the other side of the line in Pernod Vergilès, Boing Boing. So, so that's a pretty classic area uh, for Corton Charlemagne, which has richness and weight and power um, and develops really, really well over the long term. The more you get up here, or if you're higher on the hill, then the wines are a little bit less in terms of weight and power, but still have the, the minerality, the sort of licking the fresh stones feel. Then you get uh, the Alors Corton bit, uh, Pouget and Longuette, um, which are now much more south facing. So they're pretty warm here. If, if you're in Pouget, for example, and you've also got a little bit in Anne Charlemagne up here, you might be two weeks or more uh, different in picking times between the two. Most people in these two vineyards have actually removed their red wines, their pinot plants, and grafted over or replanted with Chardonnay. So for example, in Pouget, you've got the De Monti and Chevillier, Corson Charlemagne's. In Longuette, you've got Durin. Uh, Louis de Tours a little bit everywhere. Louis de Tours are the biggest producers of all. Um, particularly now that Bonnet de Marche is slimmed down a bit. And next up, we have the east facing sector, um, which is here uh, along the top of the hill, Corton, it's Corton Renard. Um, uh, and not only is it a different uh, direction, more east facing, but also you've got a different soil along the top here. You're much more into the white soil. And these are gorgeous white wines. When they're young, they're very similar to other Corson Charlemagne's. As they get older, they do age a little bit differently and they become slightly more classical white burgundies and have a little bit less of the, of the fresh stone you feel. Um, but they're really good. And the Corson Charlemagne, for example, of Bouchard and of Fayfley, two big houses, both of whom make really good Corson Charlemagne's, are both up here. And then you have a few people who are also um, down in this section. Um, Chandon de Briay have some which is partly in Les Bressons and partly in Les Chaumes, which is over here, um, uh, which is unusual. And uh, what else we've got? Uh, we've got Les Vergennes, where there is just a little hump in the vineyards there, and it is a, a, a different um, sort of um, uh, soil in that hump, um, with the result that uh, it seems to favour white wines. So most people who went to the Ospice de Bone have now got whites, Chanson have had whites for a long time, Chateau de Merceau have got whites there. Um, frankly, they're all good. Uh, of course, the Chalamagne famous producers, uh, are obviously Bonnet du Martre, also mentioned Louis de Tour, uh, quite a rich style because they like to pick later. I'm really fond of Domaine Rollin, not expensive and very, very good in the village of Pernod Vergilès. Um, there is also Vincent Rappé, I mentioned last week, because he's really good in both colours. Um, uh, he also is in Pernod Vergilès for that matter. So look out for his course on Charlemagne's, which, which age well. Um, uh, there's some from Senar and Alors Corton. Um, and then moving on into uh, La Doire, you also have one or two people, but their vineyards are more likely to be uh, up here in the, uh, the top of the slope here in La Doire, Sereny. But while we've got this map, let's talk about the three individual villages. Um, Alors Corton is the least white wine village. Uh, very few people um, uh, make much in the way of white. I had quite an interesting Premier Cru La Coutière, which I'm going to lose. It's here. The only weirdness, it's, it's Premier Cru Alex Corton, but it's grown in La Doire. And that was from um, Capitaine Gagnero, who I mentioned last week for their reds. It's, it's a very warm site that always ripens well. They always get 14 degrees every year. It didn't taste out of balance to me, but you need to want the, the richer, softer style of white burgundy. Otherwise, I've had plenty of good village La Doires and Premier Cru for that matter. Favorly have just, uh, having taken over a big block of La Doire, they've tasted both colors and decided it's definitely white wine soil. And they've got a big, maybe even be as much as five hectares of white La Doire, which they're making an effort with, and I think it's very good. 
Then you have uh, Bois de Gresson, a little village vineyard up here, monopoly of uh, Sylvain Wachet, which uh, uh, I think is really good. There's something in the plant mix there which makes it a touch more exotic, even so it's got the crunch behind. And then this beautiful vineyard called Les Gresson, on almost everybody's label. Its full name is Les Gresson et Foutrières. But Foutrières is not a nice word in any language, especially not in French. So only one person, to my knowledge, uses the Foutrières bit. The rest stick with Gresson. Um, they're a bit like the Reds. Um, they avoid the ex of La Doie. They avoid the extremes. They're about the fruit more than they are either tannin for Reds or too much acidity for Whites. But if you like crisp, fresh, chiselled white wines, then Pernod Vergeles is one of the, the absolute stars. Um, and particularly this vineyard, Soufrati, is a little bit more body. It's south facing, but more reserved because it's set further back. Um, and, uh, oh, lots of people make it, but I would, for example, uh, cite um, uh, Dubreuil Fontaine, um, who also has Claude Berthet. Uh, Soufreti, they, they have these two vineyards amongst others. Um, and those are vineyards which are Premier Cru only if they're white, not if they're red. Pierre of Colin Moray in the last two or three years has started to make a speciality of, of Pernon Vergeles. Um, uh, also Pierre Merger, uh, his Negociant label has, has got a few now, um, uh, uh, and so on. Um, you will also get very nice, um, uh, fresh. Uh, whites from Pernod in this gorgeously named uh, vineyard, which is Sous le Bois de Noël ou Belle Fille, or the daughters in law underneath the Christmas wood. So that was frolicking in the snow. And indeed, En Carradeur, um, Louis Jadot have a cuvee of red, which is Premier Cru, and a cuvee of white, which is part Premier Cru and part village, so they just call it village. Um, uh, what do they call it? They've invented their own uh, name for it. Um, Claude Lab, Pierre, something. Apologies, didn't quite get that name right. Um, Claude, La Quad, Claude, Claude La Quad de Pierre, I think. Um, but really nice wine. Um, that's a little bit of a, of a rapid summary uh, on the Hill of Corton, um, which, to my way of thinking, hasn't suffered too much from global warming and still getting the freshness up in Pernod. We're probably getting more love for La Doie. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's doing, doing well. Um, we're not going to show, um, I don't think we have the map of Savigny Le Bone and Chory Le Bone, but there's just one area in Savigny Le Bone, which is really good for whites, uh, which is up behind the village, up on the road where I live, Au Dessus des Golades, for example, in Les Vermeaux. And there is one domain which makes a really fabulous version. Um, which is uh, Domaine Pierre Guillemot. Uh, I don't know what they've, what they've done to make it quite so well, but I adore that wine. Uh, I also think there's good white in Auvergeles, so just next door to the Ile de Vergeles here. Um, and uh, for example, uh, uh, lots of people have both red and white there, but uh, Domaine Simon Bees would be one example, uh, several others. And again, it's one of those things that because you're near the top of the hill, you've got white marl instead of the clay limestone mix, and that seems to be a good thing to do. There are a few too many whites in Savigny where people have just decided they haven't sold through all their reds, let's put some white in, and they aren't all in good places. But Vergeles, Las de Vermo, and uh, Sud de Gallard uh, are two good places. Charlie Bone is almost entirely red. Again, a couple of people have planted whites because they wanted to have white, and it's fine, but it's, uh, uh, it's, 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 it isn't a classic. Um, I've been asked how do I rate Pavolo in Pernod, and to my shame, I've, uh, I go to the Pavolo in Savigny, and I've actually made contact earlier this year with the Pavolo in Pernod, but I'm not familiar enough with their wines to give you an opinion. Right. Um, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to add a totally random heart there. Um, Scott, if we can uh, move on, please, to the next map. Are you all happy? Please, please do make suggestions or ask questions on the chat or on the Q&A uh, button. Okay, we seem to have Boone here, um, which, uh, uh, as we know, is more of a red wine uh, vineyard. And I went for a nice long walk in 
in Bone this morning. Um, I'll see if I can draw the path. I parked outside the rugby stadium. Um, which must be, um, yeah, about, about here. I went for a walk up between Sanvin, Toussaint, Bresson, Fèvre, Lécu, over the top, seeing some of the wines called Côte de Bone, had a snoop at some of the some rather expensive houses up there, and then sort of wandered my way down, close and down, still above Grève, um, Clos de la Feguine, on the vineyard I know very well, um, and then uh, down actually uh, next to Cra, didn't go quite as far as that, so I came down here between Cra and Turon uh, and round the bottom again. It's given me a good chance to look at the vineyards, they're all ridiculously healthy looking, um, no mildew, no oidium that I can see. Um, the yellow vines of either virus, if it's a really bad example, uh, that's hard to change, but those which are really just a uh, de deficiency, uh, a bit of chlorosis, they, they all cheer up as soon as it gets hot. So, so that yellowing is much, much reduced from what it was. Um, lots and lots of bunches of grapes. Um, they look healthy. Um, I mean, the size of the grapes is varied. That is one variable this year as to whether you've got big grapes or small grapes. But there is no reason why there shouldn't be a pretty good vintage and pretty early on. Um, so it's still just too early. And uh, Nico Rossignol um, tweeted yesterday or the day before that he's had his first berry that's changed colour, the Verizon. But I had a good snoop and I didn't see any like that. Uh, so it really is just before it starts. But let's say it happens in a week's time. It's more and more confirming somewhere around about the 25th of August this year for the harvest. And uh, there are, at the moment, there are no storms on the horizon, but who knows. Uh, a few people at the very top of Bresson. Couple of people in Grave, maybe it's okay at the top, but there's one person who's got some right in the middle, which I don't approve of. Um, but this is really all this end is red wine territory. Um, and if you're going to have whites, then the place that I would uh, suggest uh, putting whites is, of course, the Clos des Mouches, which the Drouins have made famous. Lots of hearts there. It's not just Drouin, Chanson as well, um, Thierry Vielo Guillemard number of people have got white clay de mouche as well as red, Bichot too. Uh, but Les Aigro, particularly in this upper part, Clos des Aigro, uh, that's definitely white wine territory. Upper part of Champimont, uh, probably mont um, There's one vineyard here which Bouchard have exclusive, they have the monopoly and it's only in white, which is the Clos Saint-Landry. Um, now, I wouldn't have expected downslope like that to be particularly good in white, but when I taste the wine with I, them, I do like it. So, uh, so we definitely give them a pass on that. Um, and there may be other scattered parcels, but otherwise, uh, I think it I would prefer bone whites to be a little bit more limited than they, they currently are. Oh, if you've got a village in Lulune, right at the top of the hills, there's a spring up there, uh, that can do too. Um, but bone whites mostly, apart from Clodo Mouche, which definitely does have character and has more weight, most of them, most of them are relatively neutral um, animals. So uh, again, fine if you're in the right place, but don't plant white for the sake of it, please. Okay, everybody seems happy so far. Let's just check on the question things. Um, yes, the white Montrevenot from AF Grow. Uh, I did actually taste that in the 2019 um, uh, vintage, just, um, uh, when was it, about two weeks ago. Haven't written my notes up yet. Uh, I will just see if I can, uh, if I can actually get hold of them, um, remind myself. I remember liking it, but I don't have at the front of my mind uh, more detail than that. So I will have to check back um, in my notes. Um, there will be, what we might do, we might do a, a little sort of pre-2019 Zoom in the, in the fairly near uh, future, uh, see what we think about uh, how they're coming along. I'd like to taste a few more um, bef before I sort of go along on that. Uh, here's my note on the 2019 Beaumont Fano. Pretty and pleasing, light primrose, character to nose. Hadn't done its malolactic fermentation yet, um, or was just starting, so it's really too early to judge. But there's bits of apple, bits of citrus. Um, I thought, thought potentially interesting wine, but uh, but 
too early really to make a, make a judgment. I hope when I go and check my notes that I don't uh, disappear from you. Um, Carrington has got out of his garden and joined us from Dorset. No mark. Um, on we go. Okay, so I'm going to clear those hearts and stuff. Um, if we can move on to the next picture. It's Meso. Um, are you seeing the maps um, um, clearly enough, or, or would you rather that we had them in a, you know, um, a bigger size? I hope they're all right. We'll, we'll, we'll stick where we are, uh, unless unless you say otherwise. Uh, right, Merso. Obviously, it's white, apart from this bit at the end, um, the Volnay Santano, these different coloured vineyards, and indeed the light blue bits. Um, uh, light blue bits below, uh, which are more red soil than white. And at the opposite extremity, um, people have made really good Pinot up in the village of Blenny, but most have converted to white simply because the whites uh, are doing very well and um, uh, easy to sell, etc, etc. I'm not sorry they're growing white there, but I am sorry they've lost the reds, if you see what I mean. Otherwise, uh, and look, uh, we also have a tiny little Clos de Mouche vineyard here in red, belonging to Orange Lamar, uh, just there. Okay, I don't particularly need to give that a heart, even though it's very nice. Uh, so white, so otherwise it's all white. We've got in this green color, the Premier Cruise. We've got in the light bluey, gr greeny blue here, both uphill and downhill village vineyards. Um, so let's have a think about what used to be good, what's good now, what's changing. The Premier Crews have not got any worse. Global warming has not caused any suffering. Perrier, Charme, Genevrier are the big three. Perrier here, Charme below, Genevrier there. People often call them in that order. I have a particular weakness for Genevrier. I love it for its finesse and elegance. Uh, and we also have a little bit more focus these days on Parizeau, Boucher and Goutte d'Or, but they tend to be both regarded and priced just a little bit behind. Um, and while they are probably more interesting and a little bit more intense than any of the village wines, the joy of Merceau is to have quite so many really good individual small um, village vineyards. And the first one I ever got to know was the La France Clé de la Barre, as he was my first ever uh, supplier of uh, white wine in Merceau. Um, my second I tasted I tasted with him in Costa Rica, I chose La Fort, um, and uh, 1981. Um, otherwise, the ones which get the most love at the moment, I'm going to put a heart there over Les Narvo de Sou because we spelled Narvo wrong on that bit of the map, I have to correct that, so next edition of the book. But all of Narvo, uh, Tesson, uh, probably Chevalier too, Grand Charon, as long as you're in the upper bit, it's a little dull further below. Um, uh, what else do we really like? Uh, these are probably going to be my favourites. So what you can see about the uh, contours is that fractionally above the Premier Cruise, but only just, almost on the same contour lines. And instead of being facing pure east, they are now east. And then by the time you get up to Luchet, Menchevaux, Vervoy, there's a tiny bit of north in them. But um, remember these names, um, Gravoy, Luché, uh, uh, Mechevaux, because we're going to go over the border into uh, Ossidures shortly and enjoy those. So these are hillside classics. Um, TA I actually like a lot as well, and Clue, but I, I put them just maybe a fraction behind these chaps here. Um, Rouleau, of course, has made the Tesson what was Clue de Mont Plaisir and is now Clos du Haut Tesson Mon Plaisir on the label. He also has excellent Luchet, um, but just to, uh, I actually I may not be able to let you know now because I haven't been out and bought some myself, I should have done that, but there is a Clos de Luchet from a grower in Osset Duress called um, Dwayne Dicon, Christophe Dicon, uh, formerly Jean-Pierre Dicon, uh, which I thought was really good, ancient vines and uh, very inexpensive. Um, I, yeah, Chevalier here, uh, you get a good example from Jean-Philippe Fichet, for example. 
Tesson, Fiché, Rudeau, Bouzereau, Moret. Uh, Bouchard have a bit which they don't bottle separately. They might be missing a trick on that. W. Perron, Perron got a bit. And um, Patrick Essa at Wisson Charles. That pretty much covers it. Grand Charon, the Chateau de Merceau have a vineyard they call the Clos des Grand Charon, which is up in the top corner here. And I really, really like the wine that they make from it. Uh, and in Petit Charon, Arnaud uh, uh, makes a single vineyard bottling, which is which is uh, uh, pretty special. Um, like his wines, so they're expensive, but uh, it's really good. So I will just, while talking vineyards, I will just mention up here, this is higher up, as you can see. Uh, that's the 400 uh, contour line where my mouse is now. You're higher up and you're a little bit tucked away in the back. You might think it's cooler. In a cold year, it is cooler. But in a hot year, it forms a sort of amphitheater. These grapes, grapes ripen pretty well. So you've got um, the Comtesse de Cherizet, also known as Martelet de Cherizet at the door. Um, have quite a few vineyards here. Uh, ben Larue now has plenty because he um, uh, bought some land there. Uh, Matro, certainly. And uh, what else? Um, uh, who else, I should say. Antoine Chauvin's got a bit. Louis de Tour makes quite a big bottling uh, and so on. So uh, there's, there's plenty to choose from and uh, wines which I find perhaps less concentrated in most years than the top of Perrier, Charme Genevrier, but well worth a look at. Okay, next up is who's making good Merceau? And you've got what you might call um, a first division here. Um, and uh, well, we don't need much trouble in working out who they are. It's a uh, cost tree, of course. Uh, reasonably priced from him, high priced in the marketplace afterwards. Uh, Rouleau, Lafont, and Arnaud Ant, uh, tiny volumes and uh, unashamedly high price. But I do think the wines are special. And chasing that pack on the heels, you have Charles Ballot of Domaine Ballot Mio, and you have Antoine Jobard. Uh, not the only Jobard, but the one I know best. Uh, Stahl is slightly modernized after his father, Francois uh, Jobard, but not massively, massively. Um, and uh, then you have really quite a wide range of other people, all of whom are, are very good. Uh, Fischer I've mentioned, Patrick Chevillier, all the Bouzereaux, endless Bouzereaux. <laughs> Vincent Latour I like a lot. Latour Jura I know less well, but he's good. We ate Martineau. Um, I tasted some extremely interesting wines, not all of them flawless, because he's pretty close to natural from Pierre-Henri Rougeau, but if you are happy to live on the edge, then definitely take a look at what he's doing. Uh, a lot of what he's got is just generic Bourgogne from the bottom of Merceau, and it's a great place to get to a Bourgogne Blanc. So we're talking about um, uh, all, this, all this land down here. Um, oops, I lost my, lost my annotation. Um, but, uh, oh, can I have that map back, please? I seem to have switched maps, Scott, sorry. All this land down here in particular, uh, and a bit on this side too, but especially the stuff down here. Just, and some of these vineyards like uh, Milleron, Pelon, uh, and so on, they are, and on Lomo, they are partly in, in village wines and partly in, in uh, uh, generics. But you can get some uh, super examples of Bourgogne Blanc from down in, in that part of the world. Um, I, I could, there are just so many different uh, uh, producers in Mansa. Um, I had an interesting tasting with the main uh, Francois Gounou, where in, neither in whites nor reds do they believe in using any barrels at all. So everything is stainless steel. Um, but I tasted um, an old wine of theirs, a 1976 Goot d'Or, that absolutely knocked my socks off. Uh, and some interesting young wines too. Uh, so Merceau continues to happen, as I think I began the Merceau section of this by saying that I can't really see anything which is suffering from um, too much warmth these days. It may happen, but for the moment it's fine. One other domain I didn't mention, very interesting, is the domain Albert Griveaux, who have the monopoly of the Claude Perrier, plus other Perrier and, and various small vineyards. And I will certainly have, have, have missed, missed a few more. 
but uh, plenty for you to look at. Okay, so over the boundary, boundary from, or boundaries plural from Merceau is Montley here, Osegeres there, and then tucked up behind Osegeres is Saint-Romain. And as last week, it's not the greatest of maps, which I apologize, but if we can move on to the, to the new map, that would be grand. Right, um, so a little bit smudged because this is just a, a, a camera shot uh, from my book. Let's talk about Osegeres first, and we'll begin with these vineyards here, which are just over the boundary. So Meso Mechevaux was there, underneath this heart was uh, Meso Luce, and under this one was Meso Viroy. Almost all this sector, apart maybe from, from that heart, the heart that's top left, uh, is white wine, and facing the Premier Cru vineyards, which are red wine. As you go further up the valley, you can be red or white, and as you go a long way up the valley up here, uh, you're probably more white, but there is some good red. So, various negotiations of my acquaintance buy as many grapes as they can from this sector, Ben Naru, to the fore, um, and uh, local people as well. I just tasted at the main Terre de Val, which is very interesting, um, in, uh, here in Ossidures. They are the you know, couple who bought Blair Petal of Domaine du Blair's vineyards. Uh, they've got Ossidures of both colours. Um, also Dicon, as well as his uh, Merceau Clédé Luché, he's got two cuvées of Ossidures white village, of which the Vieille Vigne one is uh, a significant step up from an already decent regular one, but worth spending the extra on that. And then someone whose wines I adore, uh, has a, a big vineyard up at this end, um, is Agnès Paquet, She's not from this village, she lives up in the Oak Coast, in Manoise, um, but her Ossédures Blanc is a certain good value. And also Jean-Marc Vincent from Sontenay has an Ossé, uh, I think from this Bouté, which is one of the vineyards down here, um, which I've liked um, uh, a great deal. Um, Montley is one of those uh, villages which should be red, almost always. There's a tiny bit, there's one little bit um, of this vineyard down here, um, which is only village rather than Premier Cru. Uh, it belongs to um, um, uh, 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 come back to me in, in, uh, in, in a second. Um, uh, but he's got the monopoly of it and it's in white. You've also got the top of the slope above Le Dures. If you're up here and here, you should probably be white as well. Otherwise, you should um, pull Garaday, that's the name I was thinking of. Otherwise, you, um, uh, you should be in red in Montley. Finally, we come to Saramau. It was originally a white wine village. Then they discovered these slopes that we talked about last week were better in red. And you might find some red over this side here. But otherwise, much, much more a white wine village. Used to be a little bit lean and hard and difficult. Um, uh, but now it uh, can be spectacular good. They may one day um, get some Premier Cru vineyards, in which case Sous Chateau would be the, the prime. Um, three sources to talk about, and there will be others, but three that I'm aware of, is Domaine de Chassenay, who are out at the, the natural end, and I still have yet to visit them, uh, so I won't talk too much about their wines, but uh, amongst the natural Easter world, they, uh, they do get very good, good marks. There's the long-term classic, Back to Retire, but um, Sandu is taking over. Now that's Alan, Alan Grauer is the one about to retire. His uh, father was still working into his 80s. His grandfather lived to 98 and his great, -grand his great grandfather lived to 100. So uh, something in the, either in the genes or in the air of Saramount. Um, he does an interesting thing with his wines is that they're either in tank or they're in new wood. So the Saramara is 70% tank, 30% new wood. And the Ossia Duress is 50-50. Uh, which makes quite a positive punch style of wine. And uh, the other domain, which I only discovered about a year and a half ago, and have just got themselves a new importer in the UK, Swig. Uh, and I think the wines are, uh, hello Robin, I think you're listening in tonight. Um, but they make a load of single vineyard cuvées, and I'm not going to make, I remember them all. There's uh, Empalange up there, there's Sous la Roche, they have reds in Combazon. Uh, sorry, Sous Roche, perhaps in both colours, Sous the Chateau, 
uh, Combazan, Suros in, in, in red, but these others in white. Uh, Geron as well, which is there. And each wine is significantly, interestingly different. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I was really quite impressed with, with them. They are biodynamic, close, sometimes sulfur-free, but really trying to stay mainline, well being as pure as they can. So they're not in, not in the wild and woolly uh, sector. So strong recommendations from me from this sector nowadays for whites, Ocedures here, Sarama, um, bits of Ocedures there, uh, if you want really good value whites. They are um, just that little bit riper than they were before and, uh, and they were perhaps not quite ripe enough before, so, so that's, all, that's all good. Um, yeah, I think I missed your question. I'm assuming that was a question about Mercer ranking the village vineyards at the top of the village. Uh, they are actually also very good. Uh, not quite the same magic in the glass you get from Narvo or Tesson, but Clou and TA in particular are very good. Uh, but the third uh, producer in order was a Buisson. Uh, it's the main H and G Buisson. Um, uh, but the, um, uh, the brothers are Frank and Fred, in, uh, anglicizing them, and the other two domains are uh, Chassonet and Gras. There will, be, there will be other options. Right, better clear the hearts before the next picture flies onto the screen. Santo Bar. Right, so we used to talk about but three uh, senior. Uh, vineyards, sorry, villages uh, for white burgundy, Marseille, Pinini, Chassain, but saint absolutely, definitely part of the team now. Um, goodness me, I enjoy it. Um, uh, still pretty good value. A couple of people getting pricier, but typically at the moment, Premier Cru saint is about the same price as Village Chassain or Pinini. Uh, a few reds left in, in this sector, and probably also down here on the border with Chassain but um, otherwise mostly white. So Merger de Chien, En Rémy, La Châtaignière, or Claude La Châtaignière. These chaps here, uh, let's hit the heart buttons. Um, those are absolutely classic whites, and you're overlooking uh, Chevalier Maraschet here and Le Maraschet as well. Um, now you can make a bit of that for the marketing purpose. It's pretty much irrelevant, I would say, for the wine purpose. But Merger on the Chien, there's not too much slope, a little bit. You're up almost in the forest. Um, probably my favorite of the three. En Remy, you're much more south facing here. Occasionally suffers in a hot year, hot and dry year. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful. It's a bit of a difference if you're on the plateau here or on the slope. Uh, this bit called Les Corsons is also sold as En Remy. Um, but it's definitely up there amongst the top candidates. And Chateaunier, I like because even though it's tucked further back, it gets the morning sun from the east, and it also gets the sun coming down this valley, so it still has the sun uh, uh, from the west in the evening, um, but it doesn't dry out too much, there's just enough topsoil, and that's the wine I really like. And if you're a fan of um, Marc Collin's wines, En Monceau there, um, and Champlot alongside it, you're allowed to call En Monceau Champlot, uh, they make some, some pretty good wines. They're a little bit more west facing, certain richness to them. Um, and I'm entirely happy about these chaps along here, things like Frion. Um, but probably you're getting a tiny bit more bang from your buck there. Uh, I have to say this very quietly because I've got friends in Chassain, but personally, I don't like these wines quite as much. I'm not uh, actively negative about them, but, but my joy comes from over here. Uh, village Centre Bar is almost all of it as you go further back up the valley. Le Bon is a, is a main vineyard for that. But uh, talking to Joseph Collin, one of the sons of Marc Collin, who's now set up on his own, he said uh, he picks right at the far end up here, maybe three weeks after he's picking in the centre of the village. Uh, it goes, it tips around the bend uh, and is quite a lot more enclosed. Um, uh, Michael is especially mono, his Santa Bar is en uh, Remy. But if you want a huge range of Santa Bans, there are several growers who have six or eight or sometimes ten, they don't always show you all of them. Uh, but I'm going to say uh, Jean Claude Bachelet, 
uh, down in in that in this little hamlet called uh, Gamay, rather than uh, yeah, that didn't work. I didn't mean to do an arrow. I apologise. Point. I meant to let's just draw a line um, down here in Gamay. Uh, you have next door to each other Jean Claude Bachelet, Marc Collin, Joseph Collin, uh, and probably some others. Um, uh, but each of those, Marc Collin, huge range of Santa Barbara Premier Cruz, Joseph Collin, several, Jean Claude Bachelet, lots, Pierre Yves Collin Moray, his brother of, of um, uh, Joseph Collin, and of Damien Collin, um, has a big range. Um, who else? Uh, I know there's somebody else I tasted with the other day who's got quite a few too. Um, uh, Olivier Lamy, of course. Uh, so Olivier Lamy is just a bit further up the road on, as you come into Saint Aubin. And he's, he's pretty much a, uh, probably the number one star these days. Prices to match. Not everybody likes his wines because they have a, a sort of a, an electric uh, chiseled mineral feel to them, which some, some people find just a little bit exaggerated. Personally, I really love them. Um, and he is one of the people who's a fan of close planting, which gives you amazing density. So what's weird is his vineyards are up here, tucked away in Santa Bar. So you would expect normally people in Santa Barbara picking well after Cluny and Chassin, but he's almost, he's one of the very first to be out there picking. And he's, he's shown me analysis of his uh, wines and already he's got higher sugars than other people, but he's kept higher acidity too. He's definitely got high uh, extract. Um, and uh, uh, with his close, closely dense planting in his Derriere Chez Edouard, for example, which we will find behind Edward. There we go. Um, uh, Derrière shows Edouard, uh, he's got 30,000 vines per hectare instead of the usual 10,000. David, yes, um, the, the PO, various POs all have some uh, Santa Bans, but mostly they just have one or two rather than uh, six or eight or 10. Um, but very good. We'll come to them when we come to uh, Chassin Morichet. So, um, you can also buy, incidentally, from Lamy, both many of these things, the regular bottling and the high density bottling, which is getting seriously expensive. And, you know, he only makes a barrel or so of each, so you only get two or three bottles, but fascinating, fascinating to try. Um, let me have a think. Uh, I pretty much uh, covered what I wanted to cover uh, with relation to Saint Aubin, but open to any further questions. Um, I think we're just going to get our questions, which I think we've answered. Um, on we go. There's one from Elia again, which I'll come back to later on because it's about my so. Grand! I'm not drinking any. It's too early in the day and it's been a hot day, so I'm, I've just had a, my afternoon cup of tea. Jasmine, but uh, I should be looking forward to my white wine a bit later on. Time to press on. So I'll clear my hearts and co. Um, and we're going on to Pirini Morache. Okay, so nobody, nobody doesn't know uh, uh, Pirini. Of course, it's got its Grand Cruz, Morache, uh, half of, Bata Morache, half of, Bienvenue Bata, all of, and Chevalier Morache, uh, all of. Um, what's quite interesting is that a number of people actually have vines in both Bata and Bienvenue Bata, where it's uh, rows that go um, all the way down. So uh, it, it's the same row that was planted at the same time, Flavely like that, Soze got some like that, and uh, perhaps Le Flav too, though I think they've got more Bata than that. Um, but that's really quite interesting because you can see a difference and just slightly glibly. It's a bit like the difference between Chambertin and Claude de Bez. It's hardly a qualitative difference, but perhaps a touch more power uh, in the Chambertin or in the Batar, more weight of fruit, but the Bienvenue or the Claude de Bez may show better earlier on. That's, that's a pretty terrible generalization, but, but uh, anyway, uh, it just does give an indication. Um, so for me, Batar Maraché, maybe more than Bienvenue, and Morichet itself, these are vineyards that you can pick a bit later. Morichet's sweet point is around 14, and up to 14 and a half is fine. 
Um, Batar, some people are now picking earlier and are, and are happy to do so um, because they find it's a bit more stolid, a little bit too heavy if it gets over right. Chevalier, um, you've got longer because it's a slightly cooler site, a few more cool winds. Um, but because you've got much less topsoil, you probably don't want to leave it too late, uh, however, uh, because you might just start getting some slightly cooked aromatics, um, but you won't fill out extra weight by leaving it a longer time. The sweet spot in the Premier Cruise is absolutely the continuation of Marche and Bata Marche. So Caire and Pucelle, inside Caire of the Demoiselle, uh, Filatier, but um, maybe not right up to the top of Filatier, but certainly here, going through to Champcane and uh, Combat. Um, Perrier, probably as well. Uh, Clavoyon is a slight dip down. It is very good, but because you can taste them at the flare between Clavoyon and Pucelle, for me, there is a significant difference. And if you go and walk, you can see this road that comes down between the two you can see that the Clavoyon is falling away here a little bit. There's still really good wine, but, but Pucelle is, is of a higher class. And Refer can be good too. Um, up here, the wines probably don't enormously enjoy um, the heat, uh, but they do fine. Um, and what else could I say? Oh yes, I have a slight query now. There's one vineyard, two vineyards maybe, in Kiruni where I felt in 18, and I'll wait to see in 19, but I felt that the heat slightly got to them. Combet was one of them, and some people in Champagne, but it might depend where you are. Champagne suffered in 03 from the heat, in 04 from the, the green meanies, and in 18 a bit from the heat. Uh, in cooler years, uh, most cooler years, it, it does fine, but you're beginning to get high up and on low soil here. Um, I had a tasting my first for years and years and years, with Benoit Ant, brother of the more famous uh, uh, um, Arno. Um, he, Benoit's not going to thank me for saying that. Uh, elder brother, in fact, but he started later. He started in 99. Uh, and I cracked my uh, last bottle of 99 Pini Marche Falatier from him uh, with some friends in Chablis on Thursday night. And I mentioned to Benoit, I thought I still had a bottle left. He said, oh, I'm not sure what that will be like. And it was lovely, very good. But um, he has got um, the uh, vineyards in the Truffier, Claude la Truffier, which is separate from the rest of Truffier. There's scrubland and forest in between. So he's got all that. And he's also got this bit of en la Richard, which is a mix of Premier Cru where he is and village where La Lubise Loire is. Um, so those are his two bottlings uh, of Premier Cru uh, Pinini. Uh, he's making good wines, meanwhile. And like his brother Arno, he is a very early picker. Um, okay, so uh, we've covered him. Who to turn to to buy your Pudini? Well, Le Fleuve is, of course, uh, the great name. And when I started the wine trade, then uh, Vincent Le Fleuve was uh, still just about in charge. He was coming towards the end of his, uh, his, his time there. Uh, he made absolutely brilliant wines in ways that wouldn't be approved of now, uh, in terms of sort of slightly old-fashioned winemaking. They would probably have sort of had hydraulic presses. Um, really big yields, unashamedly big yields. But it just had the touch, and they were beautiful when they're young, 78, 79, so they're still beautiful now. Uh, a village, 79, Pudigny, and a restaurant in Paris just to die for last year, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Then Anne-Claude Lefebvre um, uh, came in and developed all the biodynamic things and the uh, domain went from strength to strength uh, with a hiccup in a period in which perhaps they uh, lowered the dose of sulfur too much and having seemed to be less affected by um, the wretched premature oxidation, they then became more affected by it. And now, after her sad and uh, untimely death, then um, her cousin, Brice La Morandia, has taken over, a new winemaker in Pierre Vincent. Um, Brice has taken the time to go and study everywhere else, um, around other uh, producers, and see what should be done to make the best wine. He's been prepared to invest in it. Massive investments, all sorts of things which probably shouldn't have happened before have been, have been knocked on the head. Uh, every care is now taken to make sure things get through into um, 
uh, into the bottle and subsequently from the bottle to the customer in good condition to the extent that any old stocks they have at the domain they have um, caravaned them to taste them everything that's good they have then taken the cork out topped up with other good bottles um, put a minute dose of sulfur in and put diam corks in so and anything that's not good has been suppressed and so from here on in nothing will leave the um, domain that is uh, uh, everything that leaves the domain let me say is under the Diam uh, closure, which I appreciate, but uh, aesthetically I still don't like, but I understand what it does. Then uh, another part of the Lefebvre family was Olivier Lefebvre and his brother Patrick. And uh, Olivier, having started off as co-manager of Domaine Lefebvre, uh, when the family decided that it was better just to have a single person running it, Olivier concentrated on what he was already doing, which was his negotiation company but uh, had the right up 25 years later to take his own share of the vineyards out, his and his brother's share. So they now have several of the top vineyards as their own domain wines. The wine has been made there for, I should think, at least 30 years now by Frank Grooks, whose mother was a Rouleau, and he made the Jean-Marc Rouleau wines briefly after Ted Lemon and before Jean-Marc came back from his acting career to take over. Uh, Frank is a great guy and makes a series of really, really good white wines. And when they're young, certainly tasting blind, they give the domain wines a run for their money. Soze, one of the classics when I started, again went through a period, a little bit earlier in the flair of some cork issues and uh, primitive oxidation issues. Again, seems to have come out. Again, has moved to biodynamics. It's now so they having been the son-in-law of Soze, i.e. Gerard Boudot, it's now Boudot's son-in-law, i.e. Benoit Riffo, the Sancerre family, uh, who is making the wines, and I'm pretty excited with what I've tasted in the last couple of vintages. Another uh, main family, of course, is Carillon. Uh, Robert Carillon became Louis Carillon, um, at which point it was more Francois in the vineyards and Louis, and uh, sorry, Jacques making the wine. And uh, now the brothers have separated, um, and uh, Jacques Carillon continues exactly as before. Uh, very classical wines, which, if you like the Louis Carillon wines, buy those. Francois has both expanded, uh, taken on quite a few new vineyards. He did do a bit of negotiation stuff, but now he's got enough vineyards. Um, and it is in a more modern uh, style than his brother, but is again winning great plaudits, and there's a lot of excitement about those wines. Uh, so, frankly, taste them both, decide which is the one for you. Um, uh, Jean-Michel Chartrand of the Jean Chartrand had a tricky time. Uh, the family had already had to sell some of their vineyards, death duties of an earlier generation, and then they were involved in a negotiation operation called Chartrand and Trebuchet, which we know for Jean-Michel's, uh, uh, didn't make it and uh, left debts behind. Uh, which left him in a very shaky position when in around 2004 he took, back, took on the family domain and uh, it took him a while to get properly re-established. He got some great vineyards. Um, the range is then broadened by some exchanges of grapes from their great vineyards to enable them to have a nice range of, um, they have to call them negociants because they're exchanged grapes, but a nice range of less expensive Pinot Another long established domain with great vineyards is domain Paul Perno. Um, perhaps quite old fashioned in their viticulture, but things are changing. Paul Senior is what in his 80s now, but I suspect next time I go and taste, he'll still be there uh, with his sons and now a granddaughter. And you may see wines under her name, I want to go and taste them, uh, Alvina Perno. And there's also an offshoot called domain Perno Bellicar. Uh, plus one or two negociants are well known for getting significant amounts of grapes uh, from this family. Uh, so those are most of the names. And there's one little tiny baby domain called Domain Thomas Collado, only 15 barrels, I think, apart from some um, generic Bourgogne, but of village and premier crew uh, Pinini, they made just 15 barrels in 2018. Uh, they will make a little bit more because um, some of the vineyards uh, still the grapes go out elsewhere. Um, but uh, it's called Domaine Thomas Collado, 
that sounds familiar, it's because the guy who makes the wine in the Côte Nuit at um, Domaine Tocard, Loison Fleuro, is called Thomas, first name, and Collado, second name. But in this instance, it's a uh, Mademoiselle Thomas, who is married to Monsieur Collado, so put the two together. It's the Thomas family of saint Aubin, who I could have mentioned earlier, but forgot to. Um, and she, uh, with her son, are uh, just making sort of one or two or three barrels each of several different wines. Um, and so you'll have a whole range of different single vineyard um, village Pidonies. Um, and okay, no one's going to be able to get much of them, but worth looking out for. Right. Um, what am I still to say about Pidony? Probably lots. But time moves on, and we will move on and, uh, and take a view at Chassin Morachet next door. My, my voice is beginning to give out too as I'm on double Zoom rations today. Okay, well, we looked at this map when we looked at the reds, uh, and uh, I showed you where, where the red areas were, which is almost all the village uh, wines. So everything down here, including some of the Premier Cruz. We're definitely in red. We're red here. This little close on Jean should be red. And uh, maybe one or two other bits, but, um, and you can be either colored if you're over here. But we're not talking about reds today, we're talking about whites, so I'll get rid of those. And I will run through my absolutely favorite Premier Cruise, or just mention. In terms of, is there any difference between Le Maraché and Bataille Maraché in Chassin and Pudigny? Not sure, maybe the slope changes direction and now faces due south here. Um, I'm not, I would rather just go with producer rather than saying Chassin, Spavin, Pudigny or the other way around. And then you have the Creo Batar Maraché, who in Domaine Bellon has the most of it, Lamy makes a barrel, uh, Domaine Dauvenet uh, have an infinitesimal amount, most other people are really very small indeed uh, there. Um, but uh, Caroline uh, Moray, wife of Pierre-Yves Colin Moray, is, now has a barrel for the last couple of vintages. Right, Premier Cruise. So, how am I going to pick out my absolute top favourites? Well, I am going to choose, um, I think, Vidbos here. Okay, it's surrounded on three sides by village vines. On the other side, it's Grand Cru Bataille Maraché. It's mostly in the Colin and Moray families. Uh, Thomas Moray has a good one, otherwise different colours. Um, and it's got weight and class and uh, yeah, I mean, you, it's a premier crew and a half. Um, Blanchot, the Sioux, upper Blanchot here, is one little bit in this corner next to Creo and Le Maraschet, which Jean-Claude Bachelet has, uh, which has a little bit the same exposure as Creo and is really good. Plenty of other people have very good, but the best bit is that, that bit. But that also is, is a bit more than a straight Premier Cru. Tiny holdings also en Remy dans de Chien up here. Um, my next superstar uh, sector probably begins with En Caire, uh, Grand Vruchot, uh, La Romanée, um, and uh, uh, Grand Montagne, uh, probably nearly as good, maybe, 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 maybe half a notch less, maybe not, Tete du Clos, Environdo, Baudine, uh, Ombasse, starting to get a little bit softer in style there, might be the producer. Um, so that section there is, is my other absolute favorite section. Um, they're not the only ones though, um, you get a very weighty style of white wine down here, I often talk of it as red wine soil, but you can make really good solid uh, red, uh, whites for long, long lasting from here. Uh, and you make good wines uh, up in this sector, it's a tiny bit lower lying, but between Chenevot, Verger, Chaumet, um, it really depends on where you are. Quite a few people have all of them, but let's say if you're tasting at Michel Nielans, you definitely want to be in the Chaumet. If you're tasting at uh, Jean-Marc Pio, you probably want his verger. Uh, if you're tasting with Philippe Collin, it might be the Chenevard. So it, it depends the age of the vines, exactly which, which spot uh, that there are. But the Clos de la Truffière and Le Chaumet, Clos saint -Mar in um, um, uh, verger, also the Clos saint um, all interesting vineyards. 
So St. John is fine, but I just love the reds from there. So I'm going to stick with my red preference, uh, I must admit. Village uh, is problematic because the great majority of the village uh, should be in red. Even some of the vineyards over here, like Les Pierre, which are getting close to the um, Pinini side. But I have no objection to the Les Vieres right next door to um, and Les Enseignères, but spelt differently, next door to Pyrénées Enseignères. Um, what else? Um, perhaps the section along here is also probably fine for white, would do for other colours. Les Mesures, several people make really good white salt. And up at the top, we're suddenly seeing a lot more planting in the uh, Peau Bois uh, up here. Um, but once we get down here, I'd rather it were red. Um, but the white chest signs are so easy to say. Frankly, if I'm going to buy a village wine from one of the top villages, my favourite's Marseille. I'd probably go with Pudigny second, and Chassain only if it's one of the, the specific plots that I've just mentioned, um, would I really go for. Um, so, producers. Well, um, we can play party games here and see how many members of the Moray family or the Collin family uh, including, of course, Pierre Yves Colin Moray, who's both, um, or both by marriage, uh, we can name. But um, on the Moray side, we've got Pierre Yves' uh, uh, wife, uh, Caroline Moray, her brother Sylvain, her father Jean Marc, and her uncles or cousins, which would include uh, Bernard Moray, now pretty much retired, and his two sons, Vincent Moray who makes, uh, for example, he has most of the embase and he does make a soft rounded style, uh, or his brother Thomas Moray, who has a better Bodine, which is much more mineral and, and, and sort of precise. And uh, um, Thomas Moray, I think, is a bit of an unsung hero. Doesn't sell much in the UK or the USA, but lots in Germany and in Scandinavia and in Japan. So that sort of gives you an in indication of the style of his wine. There's also Thibaut Moray Coffinet, all these double barreled names bringing in different, different families. Um, 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 there's Marc Moray, uh, another cousin. Um, and uh, I bet I haven't even covered all of them with those Morays. We have the Gagnards, Jean Noël Gagnard, uh, Fontaine Gagnard, and um, uh, Blanc Gagnard. And uh, Jean Marc Blanc is still there. He's beginning to hand over some vineyards to his son. Um, uh, I think he says he's Marc Antonin Blanc, um, and change generation, it's no longer Richard Fontaine, but his daughter, Celine, who's taken over there. Um, I mentioned Marie Coffinet, uh, Michel Nielon, I mentioned earlier in, in another context, uh, he's making some nice wines, also moving on in, in, in generation. Uh, now his son in law and grandchildren. Um, his young Armand Heitz. Um, who is uh, and Vassal Dancer, they're, they're cousins, they're both members of the Lochade family, so they have a lot of vineyards in, in common, and they're cousins also with Charles Balomio of, of Merso, uh, so he also fits into that pattern. Um, cheating, I'm looking at my crib sheet now. I haven't mentioned uh, three absolute favourites, four favourites actually, I should come to them. Um, Chateau de la Maltra, also uh, good wines. Um, FNL PO, Jean Marc PO, and uh, Jean Marc's making some lovely wine. Um, but frankly, after the great classic of Remenet, the two domains which I think are absolutely stunning and just a touch ahead of the others, but they're different in style, are uh, Domain Paul PO in the hands of Thierry, sister Christelle, which are the more flamboyant of the two but really gorgeous. And it helps that he's got most of his vineyards in this sort of Caire, Romane, uh, Grand Grouchot, Grand Montagne area. Um, and the other is Alex Moreau and his brother of Domaine Bernard Moreau, whose wines are, uh, take a little bit longer to come round. They last a very long time, but they're absolutely masterpieces of uh, intensity and long-term concentration. Um, and I will have mentioned him before, it's a much, much smaller domain. Lemmy um, Kaya, we talked about Lemmy Pierre Reds, I think, last week. 
but Lenny Kaya, uh, who's deliberately making as old-fashioned whites as he can, i.e. it is a uh, Verslin uh, hydraulic press, um, he crushes the grapes as well, um, keeps all the solids, uh, he really wants to make wines of powerful structure, long aging, which will last a long, long time. Uh, Ilya, I didn't mention where I put Pierre Yves Colin Moray in that hierarchy. Uh, I have a block in my mind, which is my own fault of not considering him uh, entirely in Chassain, because of course the Colin part of the family in Saint Aubin. So I sort of see him as a more as a producer of white Burgundy in general. But I'm I'm wrong in that. I should count him in as, as Chassain. Um, because that's his, his headquarters, and he, he's also right up there at the top. I, I certainly certainly wouldn't uh, um, belittle, belittle him, having talked about others as being my favourites. He's right up there. And he's slightly playing down, if you like, um, uh, the, the reductive character. Uh, I, th I think that almost developed more than he expected. And it's a mark of his intelligence that uh, you know he doesn't want to be known just for just for that. So yeah, uh, another great one. And I like five Caroline's wines too. Oh, there are there are too many good producers now. It's uh, I shouldn't say it's frustrating, but uh, but it is a, a factor. Now I I didn't pull out because I knew we we're going to be short of time by the time we got here. I didn't pull out the map of the last two villages, Sontenay and Marange. They are red wine villages for me. Having said which. Sontenay does do whites better than quite a few others. If you went straight over the border from Chassain, you would come to Clos de Tavern and Sontenay Gravier, and half of the Clos de Gravier is in white. I've tasted really old wines from there. Um, and now um, Olivier Lamy has just got hold of it and starting to make some pretty classic uh, young wines. Um, there is a village from the other or two, Les Charmes, for example, which makes good whites. A beau repas, it's one of the three, two or three, a premier cruise right in the middle of the village, seems to do well in white. Um, so yes, you've got quite a lot of choices um, and it's quite good, but, but I don't want them to take any more uh, land away from the reds. And I feel the same, that Marange is definitely much more red than white. Oof, um, now any more last few thoughts and questions? I am getting happier about where white burgundy is now. Uh, I see fewer bottles which have suffered. I see some old vintages which have come back from the death. Uh, Diem, of course, other closures um, are probably preventing any uh, premature oxidation showing through. Uh, so um, we're, we're beginning to live into a better time. Uh, so Anonymous has just said you couldn't see my, my mouse. Uh, apologies for that, I didn't use the mouse very often. Apologies. Um, yeah, the uh, roots of the classic hazelnut quality to Merceau. Not so obvious in modern times, but curious about the more classic versions. It used to be butter and hazelnuts, and I think the butter was more of the emphasis uh, here. Um, and um, the hazelnut was almost a form of, of sort of reduction, maybe a bit of toast from the barrels. Merceau, of all the villages, is the one which tended to do the longest barrel aging. So you would have the second winter in wood. And that maybe gave a little bit of a, uh, a toastiness um, that, uh, that, that made that happen. Um, so, uh, and Paul, I haven't tasted anything from Bernard Bonin, or I might have had the old bottle, but I haven't got anything to go on. Um, but we have so many things. Um, and Paul, you didn't mention Ramonet. I very occasionally taste at Ramonet, but I haven't tasted the young wines. Uh, on my list now, there's a change of generation. I think Noel Ramonet was quite a character. Uh, didn't necessarily see eye to eye with, um, but I'm planning to go back this summer really awesome. Um, now, uh, Doug wants to know the last five vintages for whites in general. Um, so, least favourite are 13 and 16. 13 because uh, Rock got in and if you picked early it was all right, maybe not quite uh, right, but uh, the Rock didn't take over, so you left your uh, grapes on the vines too long. Not good news. 16 was a sweet and sour vintage as uh, the frost really hit the whites worse than the reds. And you tend to have a mix of generations of grapes. And uh, the first generation was often left to mature a bit too long with the sweetness and the second generation wasn't quite right. So we'll discount them. These are with 14, 15, 17, 18, and maybe 19. But 14 is absolutely top. 17 is building and building in my estimation. 
very classical balance. I wondered if they had enough character to begin with. They have less character than 14, but, but there is enough character. Uh, and so they're high in my estimation. 18s I'm very happy with, just one or two which are dilute, one or two which got to alcoholic, but otherwise uh, very nice wines. I'm putting them behind 17. 15 is, comes in the more powerful style, um, but better managed than 09 was, for example. Um, and uh, it depends what your preferred style is. So, uh, but it's, it's very well done. So frankly, 14, 15, 17, 18, and by the looks of things, 19, uh, are all properly successful vintages for white burgundy. Um, someone called Simon wanted to put his hand up. I don't know if that got anywhere. If not, ask a question on Q&A. Um, uh, so, um, Mark, you asked about uh, Stephen Stefan Collin, isn't it? Is that the... Uh, um, um, I haven't tasted anyway. You know, it's really frustrating. I tasted so many different different domains in Burgundy, and yet there are always more, always new ones. It's it's what also keeps me interested, fresh and interested. Um, but it's uh, slightly frustrating that I, I find I can't get round absolutely everybody. Um, so, um, sixty-four thousand dollar question: How long can we age the recent vintages? Well, I'm an optimist. Um, and yes, you're right. Uh, Stefan uh, uh, Collin is the son of um, or Stephen is the son of Philippe, uh, and I haven't mentioned Bruno Collin, also who's making really nice wines. Oh dear, Philippe and Bruno. Um, yep, so many. Uh, how long can we age them? Uh, I am betting that we can age them a long time. You may feel more comfortable if you've got them either um, under um, a diam or if under cork that uh, they are waxed, but you know, restaurants are, um, find waxing tedious because it spills on the tablecloths. If we still have restaurants with tablecloths and sommeliers in the future, who knows? Um, but uh, I should be an optimist there too. Uh, so I don't really have many qualms. Um, I think the style of 14, uh, 15, uh, definitely 17 and 18 too, but perhaps a touch less. Uh, I think will age. The thing is, when you have an old white burgundy, it is so much more exciting than a young one, but it will be a huge tragedy if they aren't kept for aging. Okay, we've done our extended, our hour plus VAT, if you like, our hour and a quarter, um, but uh, I'm happy to answer any, any, any final question, but um, apart from that, I shall... Um, uh, think about what we do next. We, areas we can look at are, um, we didn't do the southern end of the Côte de Nuit, uh, sort of Nuit Saint-Georges and Vaux romanet and Chambol, and we can also extend into um, sort of uh, the Oak Côte on that. And we could put together both Chablis and the Maconnet, if you'd like to do that. Uh, leave us some thoughts uh, on, the, on the side there. Um, of any particular subject you'd like, and also your thoughts if you prefer this Sunday timing to Saturday. Uh, I can probably do either day next week, um, and then I might even think about a little bit of summer holiday. But um, keep the suggestions flooding in. Keep looking at our website, please. Uh, do not feel ashamed to subscribe to it. Um, keep me keep me in, uh, in food to go with bottles, and then food for the extended animals we have here in Burgundy. Um, and uh, I very much look forward to seeing you probably this time next week, but if not, uh, very soon. So um, thank you all for joining and see you next time. Bye.